off today with Kevin Falter, who's from the University of Florida, who's going to be talking about the science of connecting citizens to science. Um, Kevin is my kind of, I work for the Science Media Centre in the UK, he's my absolutely ideal uh, scientist because he's very, very good scientist, publishes prolifically, does excellent research, but he's come to believe somewhere along the line, I don't know if he's going to tell us how it happened, that part of being a very, very good scientist, part of being a great scientist, is to communicate that science to the public. So he's my, my ideal kind of scientist. In 2016, that uh, communication of excellence was recognized with the prestigious CAST Horlog Award in Agricultural Communications, and that same year, Kevin was named as the Ag Pro Person of the Year. He's also very brave, as I'm sure most people in this room know. Um, I've only met him at this conference, but I've followed him for years, and I was literally proud to meet him. So I'm delighted that he's here, and uh, give him a warm welcome. Wow, that's really nice. Thank you very much. That's very, very sweet. Um, so, as was mentioned, what I'd like to talk about today is mostly not about what I've done as science, but what I've done to share that science. And really, it's more about the mistakes I made along the way. Because I think there's a lot of things we can learn from the way we do things incorrectly that sometimes translates into us doing them better. That's if we're good at it. So what I would like to do is uh, basically show you the mistakes I've made so that you can uh, maybe change the way that you approach the public with the first time as you venture into this. It's uh, very critical that all of us are discussing the science in a public forum, that we're sharing what we do. And one thing that I've learned is that talking to the public is very different than talking with our colleagues. Um, and in order for us to be effective, we have to learn some very simple lessons. And um, the punchline is, is that this is a lot easier than we make it to be. And so I'd like to tell you about what, what I've learned over time. Um, I'm a scientist primarily. I work in small fruit genomics and in light. Uh, we have some beautiful work with small molecule discovery from drugs and staph aureus all the way up through new herbicides. Um, that's what I do normally. I've done that for a long time. And in the late 1990s, I also noticed what was happening with new technology, that all of this new genetic engineering stuff that was happening was being really maligned in the early days of the internet. And I would take my time to step into those discussions and kind of duke it out with the people who were saying this was bad technology. It wasn't a question of me approaching this as a nice, calm, scientific way. It was a really cantankerous back and forth with people who were speaking against technology. But I still wanted to try to communicate it. And uh, because the problem was one that we see continuously in this conference, and that we can do innovation all day. We're very good at innovation. The problem is it's slow to move to application. And it really boils down to a question of social license, meaning that society is not necessarily primed to be able to accept all of the risks and benefits, realistically, of new technology. And it doesn't matter whether it's vaccines, refrigeration, dozens of other ones through history, that we have to first have this social license and buy-in before we can have new technology really grab hold. And the problem that this creates is that innovation is really separated from application. And it breaks my heart to be at a place like this and see the talks that I see about the solutions that are available, especially in the developing world, that don't get to their target. They don't serve the people they were meant to serve, especially when it was done on the public's time. So how do we fix that? And really what the trick is, is getting from innovation to application requires good communication. And that's what we'll talk about today. And my uh, whole story in communication started here. Anyone from Madison, Wisconsin? So Willie Street Co-op is a, is a um, grocery store in Madison, Wisconsin that the joke is it makes Whole Foods look like a toxic waste dump. It's, it's, it's so green. And, but it's a, it's a really cool place. All my neighbors worked there. It was a very, um, very nice ethic, very community oriented. And I'd buy my groceries there and I realized they had no idea what was happening in food and farming. They were getting it all wrong. And so I said, I'll do a presentation for you. And I was a recently minted PhD, so I knew everything. And I, I figured I could talk to the folks in my neighborhood about genetic engineering and about modern agriculture. And they all came to the community room and I told them about uh, the 35S uh, promoter and how it would drive constitutive expression in all <laughs> tissues up topically. And I showed them pictures of binary vectors and canamycin. And, and, and guess how many hearts and minds I changed that day, right? Zero, not one. And in fact, I actually came off really arrogant 
and I came off as aloof. I came off as an ivory tower academic bringing ideas to people but talking over their heads. And I would only make this mistake for 12 more years before I started to get it right. And that's what I'll talk to you about today. How do you get it right? And I'll give you an idea of the things we'll cover, but for lack of time, I won't go through it here. It's all about trust. Who do people trust for their information? And it was this idea of how do we build trust with people in the public that really helps us communicate more effectively. And a lot has been said about this, that facts don't change minds, facts don't matter. Beautiful thing in, in uh, I think, Grist today by Nathaniel Johnson about Mark Linus' book. Facts don't change minds. That is, until you have trust. And Maya Angelou said it beautifully where she said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So this is a trick for us as scientists that we're trying to talk to their head, but we really need to be speaking to their heart. We need to have their trust. And that's what I'll talk about today. The big issue is audience. Too often we're speaking to the wrong people. And if you segment the audience of consumers down into a pie chart, it's actually pretty good news. Um, there's a few folks in there who really understand where to get the right scientific information. They make good decisions that are evidence-based about their food. There's another small group, very small group, that's causing trouble. The people that are loud, the folks that have mastered the internet, the people whose job it is 24 hours a day or, you know, to uh, develop uh, controversy that's not consistent with the evidence. Very small number of people. But the majority of people are in that blue portion of the pie. They don't know who to trust. So what do they do? They make precautionary decisions and make decisions that say, well, if there's a one in a million chance that this new technology can harm me or my family, I don't want it. And I understand that idea. You know, if you have small children, you'd be scared to death of a new technology that if there's even a remote chance of causing them problems, right? So this is the, what we're up against, is we're talking to the wrong people. Too often, we argue with the person from that small portion of the pie. We really need to be speaking to this other person and building trust with them. And I'll talk about three different books very quickly. I won't talk about them here, but their content's very important. And as a scientist, these three books really reshaped the way that I approach a public audience. The first one talks about the brain. And in understanding how people process information made me a much better communicator because I realized that people, well, I learned from Dan Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, that humans process information in two ways. They have something called system one, which is this emotional, reactive, fast-thinking brain. This is what we sometimes think of as the reptile brain, right? This part of our head that uh, hears a rustling in the bush and runs the other way. Now we've got this other part of the brain that's logical, and strategic, and slow, and calculating. This is the part of the brain that when we hear something rustle in the bush, we would go over and say, hey, what's in there? You know, it doesn't always work out so well for us evolutionarily. So this is where that, that, that fast brain has been very successful, but the thinking brain is very much a human and a, and a great ape kind of uh, um, uh, quality. This idea to use the executive function versus the limbic system. This, this is the battle that's happening inside of our head. Now when we're talking about science and what scientists speak very well is to the system two. We love system two. We talk to each other in system two. We criticize each other in system two. We're very comfortable with system two. But the public, when you're talking about their food and their farming and the, the stuff on the first step of the hierarchy of needs, that's all system one. That's appealing to threats to their family, to threats to them. This is emotional. And that's why we see such an emotional set of decisions around food and farming. And we come at those people who are having system one emotional issues about food with system two logic, just like I did at Willie Street Co-op. I'm a scientist, let me make you feel better by giving you lots of facts. Doesn't work. Um, the other problem we're up against is the tribal behavior of humans, that we tend to associate with people who share similar worldviews, and that our tribes tend to adopt different ideas, even if they're not all true, or if we don't, all buy, into, if we don't buy into all of them, we tend to accept what the tribe accepts. Uh, we use groups as a way to anchor our beliefs. And so, tribes are so important to us as humans that we even make up tribes, even if, if it, they don't exist, right? We, we identify with each other. We trust somebody who's wearing the same 
sports jersey or same football jersey uh, than someone who doesn't, even though we don't know one from the other as a person. It's our tribes that tend to connect, connect us. So how do we overcome system one, and how do we overcome these tribal tendencies? And part of this is, how do we overcome system one? Now, system one is this emotional and irrational system. And the best lessons we can learn, we learn from law enforcement. Um, in very tense law enforcement situations, a lot of mistakes are made. And this is an excellent book by Chris Voss called Never Split the Difference. He was a New York City hostage negotiator that realized the old way of negotiating a hostage situation was not working effectively. People were getting killed or injured. And what he start, decided to do was, instead, rather than coming at it with strong-arm tactics to resolve a hostage crisis, to appealing to the emotions and to the empathy of the hostage taker and asking questions and empowering the hostage taker by allowing them to have a voice in the conversation. And what it boiled down to wasn't listening to the orders out of a bullhorn, but rather than listening to the hostage taker. And for the sake of time, I won't go into the details, but this is an outstanding book to listen to uh, because they tell the stories. It's much more interesting than reading it. Active listening. Listening to understand rather than what we do as scientists where we listen to debate. We listen and someone's talking to us and we're thinking of the ways that their argument isn't so good. What we need to do is listen to understand so that we can connect with somebody by show that, showing them that, yes, I hear you and I understand why you feel the way you do. So important is a first step in terms of changing someone's mind. Um, the ideas of intellectual charity, which we can talk about later, uh, and providing a sense of control for the person in that conversation who you're trying to change. You have to show them that you understand before you can offer them a change. You have to show them that you understand how they feel and why they feel that way. It's so critical. We also can build trust by demonstrating that our values are the same. We're on the same page as they are. And this came, uh, actually, it was a very critical point from Aristotle who said that good persuasion was built on pathos, ego, ethos, and logos. Pathos being feelings. As you can see sympathy, empathy in there, right? Logos, that's words, logic, that kind of stuff. And if you think of it that way, we set up system one and system two, right? Pathos, system one. Logos, system two. So Aristotle was dealing with system one and system two. And what Aristotle said was, we also have this other one, ethos, our ethics, our training, our credentials, our values, what's important to us. And this is where we win the battle of a heart versus the head, is scientists need to rely on their ethics. Leading with your ethics, talking about what's important to you, means you don't ever have to even talk about the facts of anything. You don't have to talk about facts and details. You just say to somebody, Here's what's important to me, and, um, and this is why I do what I do. And when I do that with someone in a grocery store or wherever who has concerns, they'll say, well, how do you feel about it? I'll say, let me tell you what's important to me. It's about uh, the environment and about uh, people's health and the developing world and, and farmers. And they'll say, okay, well, uh, what do you think? And I'll say, it's safe, and they'll go, great. You know, we high-five and go get a sandwich. It's a very simple thing to persuade somebody when you're on the same page as with your values. And I tend to talk about farmers, consumers, the environment, and the needy is the four areas that I like to talk about. Can we help folks in the developing world? Can we help the American consumer make better food choices? Can we ensure that the North American farmer remains uh, in a profitable mode? Uh, and can we do this with environmental sustainability? And when you lead with your ethics and you lead with this kind of values-based discussion, it's very hard to find someone who will disagree with you. You're saying these are almost universal um, values. This is what's important to all of us. This is what unites us rather than what divides us. And then you can build trust from that. You can listen, you go to values, you earn trust. So the whole idea is this idea of finding the right audience, developing rapport, and that's the word that Voss uses in his book um, through uh, intellectual charity and listening, sharing your values, and then providing evidence that reinforces those values. Not talking about Roundup Ready uh, uh, corn and, uh, and or B, you know, BT and, 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 and cotton, but rather talking about the brinjal that's BT resist, that has BT insect resistance. Talking about the examples of technology that relate to 
the values you hold and that you share. And I think when you do that, it's actually pretty easy to make some pretty good headway and even change very recalcitrant, uh, very recalcitrant um, uh, detractors of technology. So that's the basic idea of the philosophy of how we have to approach people. Now the question is where do we do it and how do we do it there effectively? So there's two ways in which you have to participate in this conversation. Um, actually, you don't have to. You can use one or the other or both. But it's in the idea of generating content or amplifying the work of others, or both. Now, as scientists, this is something that we didn't sign up for necessarily. But in the modern day, you can use content and amplification as a way to really build a brand for your scientific self, and especially early career people. Please get involved because this is a great way to differentiate yourself from the rest of the tremendous number of excellent candidates that are out there. This is a way that you can say, yes, I'm a scientist, I publish, I, I write grants, I do all the stuff I'm supposed to do, but I also have a very strong commitment to public outreach and helping people understand science. And it's 400 words six times a year will put you above the next good candidate. Think of it this way too, content, Online, how hard is it to share something with a thousand people? It's pretty easy. If those thousand people share it with a thousand people, you've now reached a million people with an important message. You have to be in there, and we have to be supporting each other with this amplification step. And I'll give you a little more detail on that. Something as simple as blogging, writing things on Medium, these free outlets, the conversation, which will take articles from academics, these are all places where you can place content and talking about technology and, and, and uh, the risks and the benefits, okay? Not just being a rosy cheerleader for technology, but talking about the things we need to concern ourselves with. This is how you build trust, by being an honest broker of the realistic strengths and weaknesses of anything. Um, but writing articles there, and then even taking a, uh, articles that have been written for a scientific journal and distilling them for a public audience. It's a great way to build trust and share information. Um, I write for a bunch of different outlets. One of them is called Cook's Cook. And you can guess the folks who read this probably go to Willie Street Co-op and Whole Foods, right? I mean, this is, this is a high-end foodie kind of uh, online magazine. 1.3 million subscribers. And they got to read about genetic engineering, safety, and lost opportunities. And I talked about all of the values-based discussion, the things like, you know, the BT Brinjal the BT cowpea, all the things that could have profound changes for people around the world if we were allowed to use those technologies. And that's what we speak about in these kinds of things. I, I write for um, physicians. Uh, physicians are always curious about how to handle these questions. Um, I've done work for farmers, writing for farm magazines or uh, agricultural magazines, getting them up to speed on the next wave of, of technologies. Uh, I do a podcast, we're currently at about a million downloads I do this out of my office at home on Saturday morning. A uh, million downloads, 140 some episodes, but this is now a durable list of 140 episodes that you can go listen to or direct people to. You can create these durable resources that really do start to get attention. And this is something that if you, you could do this as a postdoc and put this in your application that here's my outreach and my extension. It's going to weigh very heavily for you. So definitely get involved and take these steps. I never could have guessed how much impact this had when I started doing it. I'm very grateful I started, and I really encourage you to do something like this as well. All right, wind up. All right, wind up. So here we go. So amplify other people's work. So get, um, find good work and share it with your networks. And just to give you an idea of what this looks like, that's an actual Twitter conversation. So what you want to be is somebody like this node down here not typical scientist talking to scientist, farmer talking to farmer, right? That's where we normally are. You want to be involved in this, and certainly the folks who this technology do this very well. We need to be part of that, not just preparing content, but sharing the content with other people. Lots of great blogs out there to share. Um, more and more people getting involved in Twitter from an academic standpoint. It's great to share their messaging. Um, the last thing I really wanted to mention was how do you handle critics? And I'll spend 30 seconds on this. Remember that the internet is a spectator sport. And this is a book, Hug Your Haters. You have to always take the high road. And let me just give you an example. Here's a Yelp review. Uh, food was awful, service terrible. This is an Italian restaurant, right? So someone gives it a really bad review. The chef comes on and says, obviously you don't know anything about this. It's my family's restaurant. We hope you never come back again. 
Now, this is our normal response to criticism, right? You take one at me, I'm going to do one back. What if the chef would have done this? I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Meals are our important time. My family's run this business. We'd love to try again. Now, this person will never come back, but everybody reading this exchange will because now he's used values, listening, empathy, all the stuff we talked about before in order to steer this conversation. So um, I would talk about this, but we'll let that go. So last, we'll just wrap it up. Identify your audience. Remember that facts don't matter until you have trust. Build rapport. Make sure that you're talking to other people and uh, generate content and amplify the work of others. Uh, develop an expanding media uh, set of media contacts, contacts and be the person who the media calls when they have a question, very important, and handle that criticism with class. Uh, defend science, farmers, and scientists, and make sure you're part of this conversation because it does get a little hostile, but take the high road and show your values and win the hearts and minds. So I'll stop there because i got to wrap this up, but check out the podcast. It's worth listening to. A lot of good stuff there. Thank you very much for listening.